D, as uh, those who visit us regularly know, stands for multiple things, discussion, discovery, debate, discourse. That's, uh, again, the big part. This edition of STED Talk is very cool. It's the beginning of the academic year in the United States. Uh, we, as you know, during the period of July 1st to August 1st, transition every year into the new generation. And this is uh, no exception this year. Uh, we have four bright young faces today. Two of them are going to show cases, as we always do first, so we can have a international forum discussion, and I'll be uh, uh, turning on my chat in a second. And uh, secondly, we have two of our new fellows who, and this is a new thing, are going to show research that they've done in their home institutions. Uh, Drs. Rao um, and uh, Dr. Patel, uh, two very bright young uh, neurosurgical colleagues who did uh, cool stuff in the past, and they're willing to show it in this forum and uh, withstand my withering criticisms and always inquisitive questions. Before we go on, I want to recognize uh, the next wave of young generations. They're in the back of a room. Ben, can you put on the remote robot camera? Although they sit in a safe distance in the back of the room, uh, these are visitors of a mini medical school and summer camp here at SSF, and we're so glad to have you here, and I want to personally applaud you. And as an aging person, I'm looking forward to uh, one or several of you to treat my back or my knees or something like that in the future. So that's uh, uh, very cool that you spend your time in beautiful Seattle summer uh, here. We also have Dr. Cliff uh, Pierre right back here, who is uh, serving as a mentor for them. He's a great colleague. He's been here for a number of years now. And thanks for doing this, Cliff, and spearheading this. You have a great mentor with them. I want to thank our SSF crew also for putting this on. So we have two of our uh, incoming fellows um, who are going to introduce cases of various complexity that they've just been exposed to over the last uh, two weeks or so. And then we have two guest lectures of our own in-house um, colleagues, but they're going to present research that they did in the past and will be open for questions. So without much further ado, I know I spent a lot of time talking already. Dr. Anderson, would you take the helm here? And Dr. Anderson is not a short guy, and he's wearing boots, I want to point out. I love that. So having trained in Texas, I think a boot bearer is good. Welcome to SSF, Dr. Anderson. Appreciate it. Hey, good morning. My name is Brian Anderson, and I've got a couple cases to run through this morning. Happy to share with you. Just wait for these slides to come up. As we're turning on the slides, you have to find your own PowerPoint. Otherwise, tell us if you need help. And as you're doing this, you have to tell us where you're from, where yes. were you born and raised, where'd you go to school. You can, okay. you don't want to have dead mic time. Yeah, sorry for my uh, technical woes here. I, so I grew up in the Chicago suburbs, um, moved to Florida, went to undergrad down there, med school up in Pennsylvania. Uh, did an internship in Texas, served the Air Force in Arizona, back to Pennsylvania for orthopedic residency, and now I'm in Washington for uh, my spine fellowship. So really excited to be here. I've been all over the place, and hopefully this is the most exciting place yet. So um, this uh, first talk is um, just going to be about a case report um, from a patient that we had on our service over the past week. I have no disclosures. This first patient, AD, 39-year-old female, presented to the ED with a two-month history of atraumatic left neck and arm pain. Exams showed le left triceps weakness, left long finger numbness, and a positive Hoffman's. No prior history of similar symptoms. She has no significant past medical history and no prior surgeries. So I'm able to, unable to find a, uh, just a flat plate. So I put a, um, a CT, just as a representative uh, picture here. She did have a recent cervical MRI that was obtained as an outpatient by another provider that she brought to the ER with her. Uh, this was reviewed by the spine team, which demonstrated a large left-sided foraminal disc extrusion at C6, C7. Here you can see just two selected images, axial and coronal T2 weighted. So can I just interrupt you for a second? Um, so that's very nice. So just uh, because we have also some newcomers here, why don't you use the cursor um, on your laptop and show us where the disc herniation is and yeah. narrate 
what kind of a disc herniation you suspect this is. Yes, yeah, so for um, everybody in the room and online, you can see this is an axial image. So I put you through like a bread slicing machine. Um, this is what uh, the kind of cut that it would produce. So here's your vertebral body and or disc space right here. And then just posterior to it is your spinal cord right here. And then this patient's lying on her back. So this is her back right here, her soft tissues. Um, you should see a nice open space like on her right side. And this is her right side where the nerve root is exiting. However, on this side right here, you see this big dark spot right there, which is her um, extruded disc. And this looks like it's in a foraminal position. You can see um, a corresponding image on this side. And so this is uh, her front over here and her back over here. And this is this nice bright white area is how things are supposed to look. And as we follow down, we can see this big black spot right here where that disc is extruded again. So we have um, two images that show this disc extruded. So we did offer admission to this patient and a subsequent surgery the following morning. However, due to social reasons, the patient declined. Uh, she did get oral steroids and outpatient follow-up. <clears throat> However, uh, she didn't get any better with those oral steroids and so she represented to the ED one week later with worsening neck and left upper extremity pain. So a cervical CT was obtained, plans were made for surgery the next day. So in summary, we have a 39-year-old female with a subacute left C6, C7 disc extrusion, uh, severe left C7 radiculopathy and myelopathy. Brings us so uh, go back to that MRI. So it's a nice when you juxtapose. Yeah, this is like a great uh, uh, interval summary slide. I don't have anybody else to pick on right now outside of our two guest lecturers. So when you look at a disc herniation, again, you have a microphone. You're an attending. You got to come up, man. <laughs> Gotham, you've been you've been promoted. Neil, you've been promoted. You're an attending. Bring your microphone with you. Maybe you're the Dr. Patel. He's not shy. The further back you sit, the more I pick on people. Just so you know that it's my own. So when you look at a disc herniation, again, um, what are the simple most factors, the most basic factors, Neil, that you look at? Yeah, so... Um, Speak like close to the microphone. There's a contact microphone, so you can't almost get too close. Just get close. Yeah, so when I look at the location of the disc, <coughs> so it matters if it's central versus um, um, lateral versus uh, foraminal. And uh, bingo, compression so cord compression, root compression, basically. There you go, or mix, right? So, what is this? It's foraminal, totally foraminal. What's the implication of foraminal disc herniations um, in terms of the function of the patient? Uh, these patients again, so won't lose any kind of central cord um, uh, function, so they will only have root, uh, root function issues, including pain, so radiculopathy and uh, weakness in the distribution that that nerve root supplies. Um, and so you could watch them a little bit longer per se than you would in a patient with myelopathy uh, and see if it spontaneously resolves. Also, this means that you could do a nice posterior approach because it's lateral enough and, and get that disc. So and you don't have to use hardware necessarily. Gautam, so when we look at disc herniations, especially in the neck, there's something that we always want to know, and that is uh, the consistency of the disc. So what, what am I thinking of in my question? Uh, you really want to see if it's um, calcified, how that can change your approach, change what you do, uh, see if it's an acute disc herniation, if there's some surgical change around it, really how malleable the disc is, if it's easy to come out versus the location, if you need to dig around and uh, possibly damage other structures. This is a very important differentiation. Is it a hard disc versus a soft disc? And the implication being a hard disc, the neural structures had a time, a lot of time to accommodate to it. It's a glacial process. A soft disc can be a sudden impulse. And as an orthopedic surgeon, I always say nerves are stronger than bone because bone will remodel under the pulsatile function of vessels and nerves, the perineural fluid. So bone usually is a slow growing process and the patient will have more time. They have more stenosis symptoms An acute severe neurodeficit like what you described for C7 that implies a acute impulse. Now a soft disc herniation, I'll bounce back to you, Neil, has a unique 
opportunity also has a unique feature to it. This time, what am I thinking of? Um, a soft disk. On a CT scan, it won't be calcified? So it's a not calcified disk. There's a unique feature of soft disk herniations that can happen with them. It can, what get am I thinking? Better with an get traction? better with no, traction? Get better not with traction, but by spontaneous resorption. Because the nucleus pulposus, which quite clearly popped out here, is out of its normal environment. Consider the disk space a bioreactor. And uh, the chondrocytes within that nucleus are outside of their normal uh, chemical uh, biozone, if you so will, and they can they will die off. The hyaluronic acid in there, the proteoglycans will disintegrate. So these foraminal discs are actually well known for spontaneous resolution over time, time being the factor. So tell us, Ryan, in your case, what would you have done in your institution? What were you taught to do? How were you approaching this in your institution looking back? Yeah, so retrospectively, um, with this patient with this exact same set of symptoms, um, we would have operatively taken care of this patient with um, a mini open and um, foraminotomy. Uh, and why aggressive surgery versus wait and see? What are the factors that weigh in towards surgery? I think because this patient had um, an aggressive radiculopathy, but more so the um, uh, progressive myelopathy that she was developing, which is kind of strange for this area but um, that's what I interpreted from the chart. So the, um, the indications for emergent surgery, um, Dr. Rao is from the University of South Florida. What were you taught in terms of early intervention of a radiculopathy? Let's concentrate on that. Uh, if it's really just pain and paresthesias, just sensory deficits, it will typically try conservative therapy at first, but if there's a real motor deficit, then it's more of an intervention where we're inclined to operate and reduce the uh, pressure on the nerve to get some motor function yeah. back typically. So the basic nutshell is uh, recalcitrant severe pain that is uncontrolled by reasonable means, number one. And number two is significant motor function loss. Um, and that's what I was always taught. So. Uh, uh, it's a classic thing if you don't have a gravity strength or anti-gravity strength, three out of five is the dividing line. That's what I was taught. Uh, early surgery is a very reasonable thing. So severe pain slash uh, significant motor loss. If it's a mild motor loss, it's very reasonable to wait if the patient can respond to usual non-surgical cares. What did you do for non-surgical care in your institution, Dr. Anderson? What were you taught to do? Steroids, early mobilization, physical therapy. Traction, soft neck collar, oral steroids, muscle relaxants, avoid opiates, right. try to walk, stuff like that. Okay, so uh, I'm going to put you on the spot, Neil. You know what happened here, but in your own home institution, um, what would you have done? I mean, there's a number of options here. So what honestly would you have done here? Would you have waited? Would you have taken the patient to the OR? She's in severe pain. Her neck is held forward, bent. What would you have done? We, we tend to be a little bit more conservative, so we would have done an um, injection as well, see if that alleviates her symptoms. But I think the key factor here was uh, the weakness, and that's what even triggers us to proceed with some kind of uh, surgical decompression of that disc. And uh, at our institution, we are very familiar with the metric system, so our attendees would have used probably the metric system for uh, laminotomy decompression. Um, but I don't want to foreshadow into. Uh, yeah, you're involved. Yeah, I'm going to see uh, whether my partner, Dr. Amir Abdul-Jabbar, can go live. Uh, he is at one of our um, institutions outside of here uh, because he's getting ready for an OR day. Amir, can you go live? Okay, whilst we're seeing whether he can go live. Um, yes, I'm on. I'm on. Can you hear me? Up, not the camera. Amir, can you hear us? Oh, there he is. I can coming. hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I can't see you yet. What would you have done? Um, I, again, um, I think you went through the, the basics pretty well. Um, you know, it's really how functional can this patient be? Um, if the motor is very mild, um, I think conservative treatment is, is reasonable. Um, by all the means you mentioned, you know, we do try to avoid opiates. A lot of these patients will end up in the ED getting opiates anyway, but um, if they're able to be functional, uh, some of these patients, if you've tried anything and they're in tractable pain, they're not able to actual, 
actually function as a citizen, I think that's also a very reasonable means uh, or uh, indication for surgery. Good. I want to just point out, uh, thank you for our many commentators. Uh, so we can't slip things by very much. In the future, you want to put on our neuro score, our Asia tables. There should be an Asia table in the patient. Okay. Um, that's okay. That's your first time up. Dr. Chua correctly points out, why does the patient have long track signs? This is a clearly just rude thing. I don't have an explanation for it, but she was hyper irritable. So great question, Rick. Um, Dr. Uh, Al Gaddafi points out, and thank you, uh, Dr. Al Gaddafi. Uh, whenever there's a motor deficit, we should show the Asia table. So we, uh, our fellows, do Asia tables. There's an in the chart. We didn't do that, but I think she had like a deficit of like she was one out of five or something yeah, like it that. It was on the first page. Yeah, she yeah four it's fine. Five. Four. Uh, she had a significant motor deficit. I would have given a motor score of Asia E dash R, meaning ridiculous, and I would have, uh, by memory, said she's 95 or something. She's a pretty dense. C7 yeah. palsy, both in pectoralis as well as in triceps. Uh, everything fit there, but the hyper irritability, yes, Dr. Chua, I can't explain because there's no cord compression. Now, a, another question is, what is the real indication? Dr. Huang asked that very correct uh, point. What is the role of a transforaminal epidural steroid in this setting, Dr. Anderson? Maybe a, a, a better, uh, like a CESI was something I should have written down. No, but what is the role? You have a pretty substantial, go back to the image. I always like to look at, I'm a visual person. Yeah, what is the role of a steroid here, if at all, or a local um, pain medication, a marking? Why, why would we do that? There's already a pretty substantial space occupying lesion here. So why would we do that? Well, Dr. Patel said it. So the, the inflammatory response uh, due to the the large disc there um, on the nerve root would be lessened by the steroid. Um, it, it's pretty obvious that where the problem is based on this yeah. MRI and imaging sequence. So for localization purposes, I don't think it's necessary, but. Bingo, I agree. So this would be an attempt at pain relief and trying to get the patient through the first critical three weeks. Uh, that's all. There are many people who say a pure anti, uh, uh, a, a analgesic medication such as Marcaine would be enough and avoid the steroid. Uh, Dr. Rao, would you have uh, tried an injection first in Florida and Tampa? Uh, I think, if, it really depends on the patient. If the patient is kind of hesitant towards surgery, then we can uh, attempt uh, some ESI just to get some pain relief, see if her motor symptoms improve. Again, like you're saying, this looks like a softer disc, so hopefully it can resorb. But um, if it fails, a lot of times we'll, uh, if they come through the ER, we'll keep them in house and do try and do a block. And if they don't get any relief, then we'll offer some intervention on that because it's not going to get better with, uh, like you're saying, it's a space occupying lesion with some inflammation. So block can help, but I don't think it will reduce or get rid of the problem immediately. And Dr. Maniaha Al-Gaddafi uh, told us, uh, asked another good question, soft neck collar versus hard collar. We don't have a fracture here, this is not an unstable neck. Um, a soft neck collar is my personal preference and only when the patient's up and around because you can make them nice and tall so there's a distraction effect. The patient has still a modicum of motion. So we don't want to totally mobilize them, but we want to unload the spinal column. Uh, some people hate it. Uh, you can do a little trick where you put the Velcro in the front so that the patient actually can tilt their neck forward because they like to have that escape posture. Drum roll, go forwards because we need to move forward, Dr. Anderson. Yes, sir. So we did proceed with um, an operative procedure, microscopic dis dissection, however, an open left C6, C7 hemilemiotomy and foraminotomy with discectomy. There was a large sequestered uh, disc that was removed uneventfully. She got closed, minimal blood loss, discharged the home same day. Um, she had a symptom relief and uh, initial follow-up still pending. So we unfortunately did not videotape this, and uh, that's my fault, uh, but the main point was that we did this with a small mini open procedure. What's mini open? It's two finger breaths um, uh, and very focal with uh, cervical traction applied in a, a standard prone position. The point is that this was actually hard to take out. This disc was under severe pressure and we had to go on top and the bottom of the root. This is not one of those disc herniations that just wanted to come out. Um, some of them do that very gratifyingly. We just had a very successful endoscopy course this last weekend chaired by Dr. Hofstetter from the UW and I was here for a while and I was wowed by it. And I saw how their colleagues who do endoscopic foraminotomies in the neck and cool. 
I cannot remotely imagine trying to take this disc out. We had to literally manipulate the nerve for it top to bottom until we got this very incarcerated uh, uh, disc out. So, so I just wanted to point out this, uh, and Neil was with me and he's done a lot of metrics tubes. I was grateful for every millimeter that we had to kind of move with. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I would totally agree. We, we um, if you go back to the images, you can see how the location of the disc uh, in relation to the pedicle and uh, we had to kind of find the pedicle and then go medial under the thecal sac, sac to get it. And we were extremely happy with that little extra movement we had with the open to kind of get to it because uh, it was it was difficult to kind of get around the nerve uh, root and the uh, below the thecal sac to kind of get it. So yeah, it really worked out with the way we did it. Yeah. So early decompression in this case due to the severity of motor dysfunction and uh, I, again, I've been personally amazed how a lot of these uh, foraminal disc herniations that are soft, to uh, pick up what Dr. Rao said earlier, can resolve over time and playing for time. But this patient was in, in uh, intolerable pain, and I think pretty genuinely so. So she's done very well so far, but again, this is early, and I'm sorry that we don't have a video. Let's show us another case. Yes, sir. Our next patient is 52 year old female who presented the ED with one day history of neck pain and right upper extremity weakness. Uh, she had four to five strength on the right uh, from C6 to T1. She had a history of controlled hypertension, but otherwise her past medical history was uncomplicated and she had no prior her surgeries um, and a cervical MRI was obtained. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have a flat plate or a plain x-ray to show you here. This is a representative CT. So she had a pretty, so in the future, you'll put up the Asia scores because we yes, do sir. try to do that. But um, so she had a pretty profound deficit. Dr. Rao, did you see this patient uh, clinically? Uh, I saw this patient uh, in consult. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I remember. So just very briefly and evocatively describe what her weakness and neurologic symptoms were. Yeah, she had uh, isolated right side uh, tricep hand grip and inner osseous weakness uh, that and had improved with the dose of steroids she got at the outside hospital for her um, recollection. And long track signs? Uh, no long, uh, no sorry, she did have a, a Hoffman's reflex on the left, um, but uh, no hyperflexia, clones, or Rubinsky otherwise. And trauma history, fevers, chills, all the usual questions we go through? Typically, no. She did have a one time, uh, the story is that she was sleeping, turned her neck, felt a pop, um, and that was it. No fevers, no history of recent infections. She did have a uh, recent tattoo on her back and a recent spider bite within the month that she did get antibiotics for. Right. Uh, that was the only kind of other questioning that uh, no history of cancer or anything like that and no bleeding disorders no blood thinners correct Neither. good all the usual questions we go through these days so why don't you fast forward to the mri we obviously can get mris wonderful and here we see something very weird again same thing as before would you mind going from uh, with a cursor to highlight this thing we also yeah, have sure. a special cursor but you'll learn how to use that and tell us what this means what is what image so quickly go through that Yes, yeah, so this is a T1, T2, and a stir sagittal image of the cervical spine. And I'll have to figure out how to... Just use a the cursor. There yeah. we go. Okay. Um, so this is the front of the neck. Here's the back of the neck. Um, and what you can see here is the normal spinal cord coming down. Um, and then right here, you can see uh, another fluid, fluid area with, um, with a line in between them. And you can see it most prominently here on the stir image where it lights up white. Now, due to the, this finding um, and concern for an epidural abscess, uh, cervical and thoracic MRI with and without contrast were obtained. And um, the, these, uh, these images here are from that study. Um, we also obtained a CBC, ESR, uh, CRP. All of that was within normal limits, so lessening our concern for infectious etiology. Also obtained a CT of the cervical and thoracic spine and an MRI of the lumbar spine. Uh, none of those demonstrated any kind of fracture, um, metastatic process, um, any type of infection, or any other um, uh, fluid collections. On clinical exam, I know you didn't see the patient. Was there any report of the patient holding her neck guarded or anything like that? I didn't read that, sir. Okay. 
Yeah, she didn't really write. No, she, she had a collar, um, <clears throat> but that did help a little bit, but no guarding, nothing like that. No leaning towards one side that I could. So was it a more painless weakness, would you say? She had that one time of pain, but otherwise, yes, painless, painless weakness. So Amir, are you still live? Dr. Blue Jabbar, can you unmask your microphone? By the way, Dr. Dekotowski, always thank you for uh, calling in. Uh, we saw a note, uh, yes, long-term published outcomes of foraminotomies uh, with discectomies are actually equivalent to anterior cervical fusions or mm -hmm. disc replacements. So, um, and Tim Adamson, who's been here, who's one of the godfathers of foraminotomies, uh, my old residency mate in Dallas, has published beautiful long-term series and he's shown us, go to our old video libraries of how to do a nice cervical foraminotomy. Amir, are you live? Yes, I'm with you. Thanks. Go back to that cervical image series that we had the T12 and STIR. So what do you think? I mean, this is a bizarre thing. It's lighting up uh, on contrast. Uh, it's a posterolateral, pretty substantial cord compressive lesion. She turned her head, had significant weakness. This is a normal citizen, no systemic factors. What, what do you make of this and what should we do? Rest of neural axis imaging, including brain, is normal. Yeah, in terms of the um, increased signal on um, some of those stir images, as well as the contrasted study, um, you can see that with an acute disc herniation. I've, I've had these situations before where um, there may be some risk factor where there's concern for infection uh, versus an acute disc herniation. And you really need that clinical picture uh, to differentiate the two because on imaging, they can often look the same. And what would you do here? So this is a posterolateral lesion. This is probably not a disc herniation. Um, uh, again, she has this inflammatory seam around this lesion. Uh, what would you do? I mean, she's pretty substantial. She does not have pain like the last patient, but she has a pretty profound neurodeficit. And this is a young, uh, relatively young, 52-year-old, but very youngish looking, very youngish acting uh, professional. She has substantial weakness. What would you do? Anytime someone comes in with weakness like this, I think that's something preserving neurologic function. Um, you know, regardless of what the source is, she's got a compressive, compressive lesion. And so doing a decompression acutely, I think, is very reasonable. So does the decompression, would you do a fusion? Is that the cervical thoracic junction? We're kind of worried about this tracks all the way down to T4. Would you do a fusion at this? Or how would you address the structural concerns in this regard? I think if... <clears throat> if the lesion is, um, you know, for instance, a hematoma where you can do a more limited bone resection um, or an abscess that is more liquid in nature, you can do a smaller laminoforaminotomy. Uh, that's very different than if you're doing a full laminectomy. I think you have to be prepared to do a full laminectomy in that case. I uh, definitely would want to instrument it um, for worries of post-laminectomy kyphosis. Let me ask Dr. Patel an unfair question, but we don't have the whole image series here. Why is this not a uh, extradural um, uh, neural tumor, a schwannoma, a meningioma, something like that? What makes this not likely? Microphone, microphone, proximity. The, the shape of it, um, it does ma not make it a schwannoma for sure. The location um, and then meningioma wise, we don't have the contrasted images here, but again, just the, the shape of it. Uh, doesn't uh, make it seem like it's more of a, a metastatic. If you can use a classic catchphrase that when we write uh, written exams, which I used to do, use what name would you apply? What word would you apply as a descriptive term for a schwannoma and meningioma? And what makes this unlikely in terms of the shape description? Um, circular, uh, well, like spear, so P, something like a P or... Dumbbell, dumbbell. ovaloid, uh, through the neuroframe and stuff like that. This is an intracanal extra dural lesion. So what did we find? And I think I did not take images of it either, which is frustrating, my fault. We kind of went through this already. Um, yep. So we did do a microscopic section with an open right C5 to T1 midline sparing hemilaminotomy with hematoma uh, appearing. Uh, fluid evacuation. Uh, primary closure, she did get a drain. Blood loss was minimal. Drain was pulled and she was discharged home the next day. Cultures are still no growth to date and her initial follow-up is pending as well. So Dr. Rao helped with that surgery, did a beautiful dissection there. Dr. Rao, give us a visual descriptive um, uh, representation of what we encountered. Sadly, I did not take a picture. Next time, remind me to take pictures of videos. <laughs> Will do. 
Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, like what Dr. Abdul-Jabbar said, we were kind of prepared for anything that came through, so we kind of consented for uh, all, all and above uh, procedures. But fortunately, what we found was just uh, um, coagulated blood products without any sort of uh, purulent superior material or um, tumor-like uh, material, very kind of thick blood that we're able to um, uh, suck up and decompress the nerve. We're able to get into the foramen by, on that right side and really get a good decompression. So fortunately, just uh, blood. Uh, so this is about uh, index, my index fingertip size. I'm using my index finger here, not any other fingers, just for the points, but it was pretty substantially sized. It was organized, the yep. venous. What about, um, and this is always a paranoia, especially for orthopedic spine surgeons, what about an AVM, an arteriovenous malformation? How could this have happened, and why is this not an, a malformation, a vascular malformation? Typically, you'll see uh, some flow voids on the uh, T2 axial images. Um, a lot of times when these durolabia fistulas or AVMs um, rupture, uh, the patients are a lot more or profoundly weak. Uh, for AVMs, they're typically uh, intradural, um, so they typically present with profound weakness. Uh, the dura AV fistulas also have uh, profound weakness as well, and uh, we just didn't see any flow voids on the MRI or any kind of uh, vessel. Also, when we took the blood, there wasn't continuous bleeding that would also lead to some sort of vascular malformation being the etiology. Right. if you don't mind going back to that uh, triple, uh, the triptych image of the three MRIs. Next one is the doc our long-term follow, Doctora Ethel Luhan Medita uh, Madera, asked a very good question, as always, and that is, can we tell that it's a hematoma by the uh, uh, signal intensity on T2 and um, uh, STIR, like acuity of a hematoma? Typically, you can. Um... There's a, a mnemonic that you can use to determine if it's old blood, new blood, chronic blood, uh, based on T1 and T2 images. Um, I think our main concern was the amount of inflammation in the uh, prevertebral space that kind of led us astray in terms of things as infection versus some sort of tumor etiology, but you typically don't see it as much on a, on a hematoma. Great inference by uh, Dr. Luhan Medisa Madera, and that is uh, if it's a pure hematoma, you could wait and see uh, and follow it prospectively with a repeat MRI scan after 72 hours or something like that and see if there's a signal change. But again, given that inflammatory rim, uh, rim around this and the substantial nature of a motor deficit, um, we decide to intervene surgically. Uh, I would do the same thing if this is myself. Any thoughts from you and Dr. Anderson as you review those cases? Uh, no, I thought those were excellent introductory cases for me. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, and let's get your compadre, Dr. Davis, up. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Davis is ready for action. He's wearing his scrubs. Our sleeves are rolled up, and he'll tell us in a second where he came from, and he already has a nickname. Thank you again, Brian. He's D3, Dr. Don Davis is third. So tell us where you're from. Uh, good morning, my name is uh, David Davis. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, born there, raised there, went to undergraduate, University of Georgia, Medical College of Georgia, trained at Atlanta Medical Center for my residency and then uh, moved to the other corner of the country to Seattle for my fellowship. I'm really excited to be here. It was a fun adventure for um, me and my family. Uh, Let's see. Uh, we'll have to call for Ben's help. Oh, let's see. Oh, I just uh, present like a normal computer. There we go. All right. So, uh, honored today, like Dr. Anderson, to present a few cases from the last month. I have no relevant disclosures. Uh, <clears throat> patient one uh, represents a 58 year old female who uh, presented. <clears throat> on uh, Friday, uh, July 21st, uh, with neck pain, right, right upper extremity weakness. A brief uh, recount of her history is that on Sunday, she had an atraumatic onset of right upper extremity pain only. Uh, on Monday, she developed a fever and chills that was resolved by Wednesday. And then on Friday, uh, the day of her presentation, uh, she had the onset of weakness. Her history is significant for uh, uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, recent periodontal disease, and she has a BMI over 35. Um, apologize in advance that I also don't have Asia tables. Um, I can describe uh, that her physical exam, she had uh, <clears throat> proximal weakness and uh, bilateral shoulder girdles, uh, 
most significantly, she had one out of five right deltoid and right biceps. Uh, she also uh, presented with a positive Hoffman sign and elevated inflammatory markers. Uh, <clears throat> on imaging, we saw that she had a, developed a uh, global kyphotic deformity uh, with moderate to severe uh, disc changes in four or five and uh, more significant disc, change, uh, disc degeneration in five, six, and six, seven. She was holding her head in a forced uh, kyphotic deformity and was unable to actively uh, extend her neck back to neutral alignment. Uh, we can see on the uh, different weighted sequences of the MRI that she has uh, retropharyngeal abscess uh, that is loculated. She has abnormal soft tissue thickening uh, with uh, <clears throat> hyperintensity on T2, uh, all consistent with infection uh, when combined with her laboratory results, uh, looking at individual levels at four or five with her uh, moderate to severe, where her moderate to severe disc disease is present, you can see some canal thickening, some right foraminal stenosis. Uh, also draw your attention down to five, six, and six, seven. Uh, there is some motion artifact, but nonetheless, we have plenty of uh, imaging to uh, adequately evaluate and uh, treat this patient. Uh, of note also, you can see on the advanced imaging, but she has no tracheal deviation. That's very good. So, but she has a retropharyngeal disease. Yes. So she has, uh, can you just use a cursor quickly to show, yeah, maybe this yes. is the best image, use a cursor to show the retropharyngeal fluid? Yeah, so mo I think it's most easily appreciated on T2 where the images are white and you can see that she has this prevertebral swelling and fluid collection. Yeah. And so this is a combination of epidural fluid collection, prevertebral fluid collection, Motor deficit, was she myelopathic? She was myelopathic, she had a positive yeah. Hoffman's. And severe pain, and she was in denial, by the way. I interviewed her several times about that. She works in healthcare, by the way. She's in oh. denial that she had diabetes, so I thought that was uh, just, uh, huh. it's, it's a terrible disease, but it's a particularly pernicious disease in patients who are in denial that they have diabetes, and she's a very large patient. So, so Neil, did you know this patient when she came in, Dr. Uh, no, Patel? So go, go close, yeah, I know that, but uh, this is why I'm picking on you. You can cl get close to the microphone. Yes. So in your institution, uh, what would you have done with this? Is this an emergency? This patient comes in on a Friday evening. Would you say, um, let's wait until Saturday to follow, or would you do something more urgent with this patient? I think we'd have done something urgent. We'd have immediately give her steroids, which we did here as well. In a diabetic, wait, for, sorry for interrupting. In a diabetic patient, you'd give her steroids. Uh, with an in infection. the hospital, yeah, probably. We'll give a, a small dose, not not a small dose. dose. Yeah, four, oh, four to six dose. or something like that. Taper it off pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, but uh, and put her on insulin drip if needed. Um, um, br brought up the maps as well, and then taken her to the OR just like we did here. Uh, we would have probably proceeded with a posterior decompression infusion. In all honesty, a posterior decompression infusion. Now here you have my jaw dropping. I got to relocate my mandible. Yeah. Okay, so why posterior? This is an anterior disease. Right, uh, I think uh, our worry usually is the spinal cord compression and not being able to know the exam uh, or the compression with the anterior positioning. Yeah. Uh, and hard to kind of assess. So uh, in an ideal world, probably do lemon laminectomy posteriorly wow. and then do... Okay come around, do anterior, go posterior again, but uh, really um, address the compression first because you can't really um, tell what the exam is going to be during position. So do you know what Sutton's law is? Sutton, Willie Sutton, famous bank robber, depression era. He was asked, he was apparently a very successful bank robber and he was finally caught and he was asked what's this uh, uh, kind of a secret of success? Do you know what the fame, no, nobody knows what Sutton's Law is? It's too young of a generation, Dr. Gottlieb. His famous answer was, I go where the money is. So that was his answer. So my point here is there's retropharyngeal disease, there's severe disc disease, and there is an anti-epidural abscess. So I, I'm just surprised, I'm not questioning, because uh, there are many, many uh, successful pathways towards success, and doing surgery, I think, is important. But whenever I was always taught, whenever there's retropharyngeal disease, you should go in the front and maintain airway first and foremost, and that's a less traumatic exposure. What about in your home institution? Would you have gone anteriorly or posteriorly? We, do, uh, we would have gone anteriorly in my institution. Yeah, but yeah, and I'm always surprised and always happy to learn and see. So let's take us forward a little bit. So what did we do? <clears throat> Yes, so uh, we, did, we did discuss our uh, decision tree. Uh, 
so our chosen intervention was to do an anterior decompression via carotid exposure, uh, given the fact that there was an abscess and broad drain was placed. And um, I did include several cuts just to uh, emphasize that we did get bicortical screw fixation, which was important for uh, the stability in this patient. Oh, so if you go back again, yeah. So again, uh, we went anteriorly. Did we do this emergently? Did we wait for a week? Did they give us steroids? What did we do? No, in the, in, in the development of an acute myelopathy, this is a urgent surgical issue. Yeah. And what about antibiotic management? Did we wait to give her antibiotics? What do we do in that regard? So we get ideal cultures, perfect cultures? or No, I think the, uh, the, correct, the correct treatment would be to go ahead and treat with antibiotics. Um, you can go ahead and draw blood cultures, mm -hmm. um, which in this case grew MSSA and showed bacteremia. Bingo. So um, this is a classic case. How did she do postoperatively? What was her main neurodeficits in surgery? Postoperatively, she has a uh, continued C5 palsy. Um, likelihood, given that her left-sided symptoms resolved, uh, that she has a post-op C5 palsy, uh, which is typically expected, but uh, you know, hard to say. Hard to say when you decompress whether the uh, deficits. Uh, all are going to get better or um, have incomplete resolution. Uh, really, in the setting of myelopathy, my understanding at least is that you're, you're trying to halt the disease. So uh, the fact that she improved it all is a win. So Dr. Rao, you saw the patient before and after surgery. What were your impressions of the neurodevelopment? How did the patient do pain-wise? Uh, pain-wise, she had improved. She, her main complaint was uh, some C5 uh, radiculopathy paresthesia that was improving overnight. but. Um, her neck pain improved, and her uh, unfortunately, her neurologic deficits uh, one to two days post-op did not improve. Um, we did get a very good decompression in the foramina um, at C4556, but she still had a significant deltoid and bicep weakness uh, that was similar to pre-op. Yeah, so she didn't deteriorate, actually. She's a pretty profound C5 palsy with both deltoid and biceps. She did not have as much of a sensory deficit, so this is a, a pretty significant classic C5 palsy. I don't think we made it any worse uh, with our surgery. Uh, anything you would have done differently in your home institution in Tampa? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, um, I think going anterior was the right approach uh, in order to regain some low doses. And like you're saying, a lot of the uh, abscess was ventral. Um, I think we would have probably done the same thing um, in Tampa, just gone urgent emergent to the OR to, um, given her profound neuro deficit, I don't think there's a reason to wait. And her bone quality, how would you rate that in surgery? She's a larger diabetic female. Large woman. Uh, she has some sclerosis in the vertebral body is at 5'6", which kind of helps with the screw placement. But yeah. otherwise, her bone quality was uh, adequate enough for um for what we did. I think the bicortical purchase is, is good just given the kind of poor wound healing properties of these diabetic patients to yeah. ensure that she has some good fixation. Yeah, in every regard, I'm not saying you're wrong there, Neil. I would have said anterior for sure, just also from the wound healing standpoint. This is a large patient and putting a large patient prone for posterior surgery. Look at those neck folds. Oof, I'd much rather do anterior surgery, but I don't want to diminish the accomplishment of doing a nice anterior dissection. In terms of um, uh, the the main uh, impetus of this is why did this actually happen, Dr. Davis? So there was wh why do patients have spontaneous spine infections? What's what's going on there in well, this patient? Like use this patient as an example. Sure. I mean, in terms of the spontaneous infections, um, really the the host is everything, and then the history as well. So sh the fact that she had periodontal disease, she has uh, obesity and uh, in conjunction with her diabetes, um, she is at higher risk for um, any sort of infection to be able to seed. Uh, she has a have bacteremia, so it's, uh, you know, you always want to look for um, sources of infection, whether that be bed sores, uh, ingrown toenails. Uh, <clears throat> It's hard to say with certainty. Uh, I don't think that I don't think that an obvious source was found other than the periodontal disease yeah. in the history. Um, but why does it target in terms the spine? of the in terms of the why does it go into the spine? Why does it go into C5, 6, C6, 6, 7 in this lady? Uh, other than the hypervascularity of the region. So the best theory is these patients have a strong inflammatory disease process. Yes, sir. And it basically inoculates uh, inflammatory pockets uh, that are uh, surrounded by a vascular environment and basically they probably form vascular mm -hmm. um, thrombi, bacterial thrombi that then once they pop into this inflammatory nidus have a Burger King for bacteria, so mm -hmm. to say. So uh, inflammatory nidus is the problem here and uh, opportunistic 
circulating bacteria can basically target that and hit this. Um, well, a great question by Dr. Rudra Patil. So uh, let's ask uh, maybe Dr. Patel. Um, <clears throat> by the way, there was a resounding online uh, denial of a posterior approach. So, so the online community gave you a thumbs down on your posterior approach. Sorry, man, I just had to share that. But uh, can we give steroids in a diabetic patient with an infection? Dr. Patel, uh, Dr. Patil, Rudra Patil asked this very good question. Can you elaborate on that question? Um, yeah, uh, I think you can if you're going to monitor the patient well, if they're going to be an insulin drip and things like that. Yeah, you're, you're definitely you definitely can. So you got to watch potassium. You got to put them on a sliding scale and a very aggressive monitoring scheme. And the benefit of steroids um, in a diabetic patient with an infection are what? Um, benefits of steroids in the first place are, are controversial. Um, you need significant amount of doses of steroids to actually really have an impact. So low doses, not quite sure, but uh, we're just trying to help uh, every little thing as possible. So probably for our own sanity, but. Yeah, so the steroids I would not feel strongly about. Uh, starting antibiotics right away, I agree with Dr. Davis, is I think very important. We don't have to have microbiologic purity. We want to get something antimicrobial going in a systemically ill patient, uh, ASAP, until the surgical um, principle of ubi est pus, ibi evacuo, that's Latin for where there's pus, we will evacuate, um, has been fulfilled. All right, next patient. Yes. Thank you for all your questions. Differential diagnosis, TB, yes, Dr. Salazar, we always send for acid fasts, we always send for fungi and immune compromised patients. And yes, uh, in our next TED talk, we'll show some recent TB cases here, which surprises. So always think of TB. Thank you, Dr. Salazar. Thank you. Go for it. Uh, yes, so patient two. Oh, one, one more quick point. Yes, sir. Is it always easy to correct a kyphotic cervical deformity with intervertebral cages? It's a matter, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, a long term friend, Dr. Amin Hanin, asked that. I find, yes, it's a matter of surgical technique. I like uh, uh, um, Casper pins. I very carefully dissect out the uncovertebral joints and literally um, uh, disengage the vertebral bodies from another. So it's less the cages, it's more the surgical release uh, that I learned and that credit for our from our disc replacement uh, experiences. So uh, it's the release, it's the appropriate debridement of the osteophytes and it's individualized skeletal traction and then the cages will hold quite nicely. And yes, I follow uh, the wonderful Dr. Wolfram Kaspar's teaching. I was personally very privileged to learn from him that we use bicortical screws. Um, that's uh, my best thing and try to put each screw very meaningfully into a powerful part of the virtual body. So thanks for that question. All right, go for it. All right, thank you. Moving forward, we have a 56-year-old uh, Samoan-speaking gentleman who was in a car accident in 2021 and was and presented this year in April of 20, April 26 with pain and weakness after a motor vehicle collision. Uh, we have these uh, scout scoliosis films. Um, you can see a mild curvature that does not uh, measure greater than 10 degrees, and you can see a, a history of a T11 compression fracture that was sustained, sustained at the time of the uh, at the time of the accident. Uh, on this x-ray, further imaging is going to be better uh, to, first we can appreciate this lumbar compression fracture with a localized clap angle of 10 degrees, kyphotic deformity, uh, drawing your attention then to the lumbar spine. Uh, the patient also has a, a grade one degenerative and isthmic spondylolisthesis. Um, and rem remember that his initial presenting symptom was low back pain. Uh, flexion extension views uh, demonstrate uh, the slip of two millimeters and one millimeters respectively at each level, consecutive level, um, not being mobile. Uh, as we look at the, uh, I'm amazed and relieved that this video works. As nice. we look at the lumbar, lumbar spine MRI, uh, <clears throat> although it was supposed to loop, uh, you can see that there is foraminal stenosis um, <clears throat> and uh, but overall, um, not a lot of central canal compression. Uh, let's see. And uh, I lament that these cuts are not oriented in the ideal way to look at L4, L5, but nonetheless, you can see, again, the central canal. So we see facet joint discongruence. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. So there's lumbar disease, L4 through S1, especially with an isthmic spondylolisthesis at L5 S1, looks like chronic disease. This is a very tall, very formerly very large male, over 300 pounds mm -hmm. in the past, of a warrior type stature. 
uh, I would like to have him on my rugby team and now, <laughs> but this is remote medicine. So uh, a spine surgery friend of ours who works on uh, Samoa um, called me about him and uh, go, go forward. I think you're showing what I'm wanting to point out next. And he basically said this guy had a fractured T11 area and he needs that fixed. And I said, no, this is healed. Why would we do that? Uh, he has a bad lumbar spine. We can gladly look at him, keyword here, but I was in denial that T1011 uh, was a problem. Just looking at those x-rays, and you know the case, obviously. Um, uh, Dr. Rauer, I'll pick on you here. We are an AO North America Spine Center. We're proud of that. We also use the AO classification. What AO classification would you have attributed to this particular fracture and this simple x-ray? Um, probably an AO uh, spine, I think A2. Just a, compression. A2, so a compression mild, factor, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. This is a there's nothing much there, right? And it looks healed, it looks trivial. So that's what I said online when we kind of had an online remote discussion about this patient and our local surgeon in Samoa basically treated him, but he insisted that this was a problem, so carry it forward. Carry it forward. So he does return uh, after obtaining the advanced imaging of the lumbar spine uh, for further thoracic. And then on uh, in May 24, uh, the decision was made to obtain further thoracic imaging. Uh, so we obtained uh, th thoracic MRI. And you can see that uh, a few things uh, <clears throat> about this. Uh, you can see that there is certainly central canal stenosis uh, behind the T10, T11 disc space. We noted the uh, local kyphosis of 10 degrees. Um, <clears throat> you can also see uh, you can also appreciate facet hypertrophy uh, and global picture of stenosis. A more detailed physical exam uh, does reveal clonus, four beats of clonus and bilateral lower extremities. Um, and this patient was, was uh, despite the language barrier, able to differentiate um, his low back pain from his uh, typical myopathic symptoms. I found this a very important learning thing for myself because I was sure this patient had low back problems and I was wrong in terms of my remote assessment until I saw the patient. He had very pertinent complaints to imbalance, gait and posture. He said, I can live with my back pain. I dropped like, he dropped like 50, 60 pounds mm -hmm. because I told him this year, you're way too big. I, I would really like to not operate on him. But I said that mainly in anticipation of possibly doing L4 to S1 surgery. But he said, I've lived with my back pain. I have no problem with this. I cannot stand properly. Mm -hmm. And I have loss of control of my legs. He enunciated thoracic myelopathy perfectly. Uh, and uh, pretty remarkable. He had no pain there. Uh, Amir, are you live still? Is Dr. Tarkin yes, I'm still with you. Can you hear me? What, what did I? Uh, what injury did he have in retrospect? We thought. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Gautam Rao. I thought this patient had an old compression fracture. In retrospect, what did he actually have at his thoracic lumbar spine? Why did uh, this happen? What What happened to this guy's thoracic spine? Yeah, and I think it's a it's a great point to bring up because. Um, you know, in certain populations, we do see whether it's OPLL or this kind of hypertrophic facet disease um, in the setting of a maybe congenital stenosis. Um, <clears throat> if you have two out of the three, maybe not that bad, but with the, even that small compression fracture, for him, there was just not enough room. It looks like it was kind of a combination of all three together. So hypertrophic bone formation, and this was an old flexion distraction injury, which Dr. Davis would be classified as what? Uh, AO3. B B3, AOB3, uh, bending injury. Uh, wait, yeah, wait, I'm wrong, B2, B2, B3 is the extension. So a bending injury with a flexion distraction component is a flexion distraction injury. It's an untreated flexion distraction injury, and being a proud man, he would always hyperextend, and he basically as Dr. Abdul-Jabbar said, overgrew his facet joints and impinged his cord. And uh, that was the problem. So what did we do? So after this, obtaining this uh, thoracic imaging, he was brought back July 5th, uh, made the diagnosis of thoracic myelopathy was made and the, the decision for surgery. Um, pertinent objective, we discussed his physical exam already. Um, and so when we look at his summary, this man has thoracic myelopathy um, that was somewhat masked initially by his lumbar spine pathology and low back pain. Um, but uh, our decision tree really centers around um, treating those 
treating uh, our decision to treat uh, both of these distinct symptoms sourcing from two different pathologies. So. Uh, Right off the bat, conservative management would be inappropriate. Uh, thoracic decompression uh, at this level specifically generally has a higher complication rate and is frankly unnecessary uh, for what we want to accomplish. So the real decision comes down to uh, whether we're gonna do uh, an isolated posterior thoracic decompression uh, versus a thoracic decompression and extension to address the lumbar deformity, which would be um, relatively extreme for this patient. Uh, he's lost a lot of weight. He's dealt with his back pain and his specific issue uh, is is the thoracic myelopathy. And, and I, I like to just highlight the theme of this presentation that we've touched on is, is really comes back to the humanism of medicine and dealing with somebody who um, is not an English speaker uh, in the age of virtual virtual medicine. Um, it'd be very easy to, to miss this diagnosis. And um, as we've discussed multiple times today, myelopathy is not something to be trifled with. Um, and so it, it, it takes the uh, astute, uh, it takes astute clinical thinking as well as um, patience and compassion uh, to make sure that we treat everybody correctly, uh, regardless of their history or our ability to communicate. Um, so our chosen intervention was uh, T9 to T12 laminectomy with instrument, instrumentation and intradiscal osteotomy uh, was performed at T10, um, which allowed us to correct some of that local kyphosis. Um, and we chose, as, as seemed obvious uh, from our uh, case discussion, uh, that we were going to uh, for now, not provide any immediate intervention for the lumbar spine pathology. It was an important part of the consent process to explain uh, what we were addressing and that the low back pain was not being addressed by this surgery. Uh, preoperative and postoperative imaging, uh, we don't have a, a dedicated preoperative spine CT, but nevertheless, um, we were able to see uh, our local kyphosis and correction uh, in these pre comparative pre and post-op imaging. And how do you do? Uh, did well post yeah, operative. Post up yeah. day three, went home despite it being an open procedure. Yes, Dr. Tua did an open surgery, not a, not an endoscopic surgery. Sorry, Dr. Tua. <laughs> but yeah, uh, uh, interdiscal osteotomy, bilateral uh, hemilaminotomies, and uh, actually midline laminectomy here, correction, and standard IDO. And uh, we basically straightened them out under neuromonitoring and um, actually restored height and not much blood loss. And he was quite happy. So myelopathy, I don't think he had much of a hyperflexia afterwards. I'm not sure. Do you remember who saw him with me after surgery? I don't think so. Not much, yeah, but very gratifying. But yeah, I want to uh, uh, thank you for pointing out this was truly one of those learning points of you can't really do remote medicine with spine that well. Uh, you need to see the patient, you need to interact with them, and you need to examine them. And this was the exams as direct interaction, which proved that I had been wrong with my uh, remote accession that this was not a problem of the thoracic spine, but of the lumbar spine. And the uh, patient himself then could enunciate that quite well. So, so far, so good. And um, so far, we're happy with that. Thanks for this great presentation. All right. So now to our highlight speakers. Um, and we'll have time for discussion. Dr. I'll invite Dr. Gautam Rao uh, to the front. And uh, uh, Dr. Rao is from the University of South Florida and Tampa. And he's here for six months for an enfolded fellowship. Uh, he's a neurosurgical colleague. And we've had a great working relationship and a lot of collegial contacts and professional contacts to USF. And it's great that this continues with Dr. Rao here. And he's going to present uh, some work that he has done at his home institution at the University of South Florida on something that we all are cursed by and have not resolved, and that's adjacent segment disease. Thank you, Dr. Rao, for coming here. And thank you for sharing your research experience, which hopefully will inspire more research as this new academic year starts. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Really appreciate it. Uh, great to be here. Uh, like Dr. Chapman said, our, our program has had a few uh, residents come by and they've only said great things. So uh, pleasure to be here and work with all of you and uh, present some of the research that we've done at the University of South Florida over the past year. Um, I had to delete some of the slides, it's kind of a little long, but this, uh, this presentation was co-opted from uh, our spine director, Dr. Puya Alakani. So uh, big thanks to him for helping me out with this. Um, so obviously proximal junctional kyphosis, distal junctional kyphosis and failure, kind of the uh, end of, or the sequela of all the surgeries we do, unfortunately, um, in order to help some people, we end up having to operate on them again and again in order to uh, fix the problems that we iatrogenically create. Uh, no relevant disclosures. Uh, objectives, um, again, I'll be kind of quick, um, just because there are a lot of slides, I wanna kind of get through the case presentations, but, we want to describe proximal junctional and distal junctional failure, identify certain risk factors, uh, how to reduce the incidence of both 
um, and using uh, different techniques that we've used throughout the few years in order to um, try our best to get rid of this process. This is the first case. We have a patient, 70-year-old male, obviously a obvious uh, coronal and sagittal deformity uh, secondary to multiple MIS techniques. Not saying MIS is bad, but uh, not sure if this is what he needed. He had a lot of back pain, inability to stand, um, severe sagittal and coronal imbalance, uh, as described before, just uh, terrible um, quality of life this patient has. What is PJK? PJK, or proximal junctional kyphosis, is typically the angle of caudal end plate of UIV uh, to the cephalad end plate of UIV plus one. So you can see here, um, there's the UIV, UIV plus one. Um, there's a lot of variability between uh, what the reported literature says, between uh, 10 to 20 percent, some even say 20 to 40 percent. Some people say it's a radiographic finding. Initially, you get your post-op x-rays six months, one year out, and you see people with uh, slight uh, angulation kyphosis at the top of their construct. Uh, typically, hopefully, they're, they're doing well, uh, just some back pain or no complaints at all, and you continue to monitor them and watch them because you uh, hope that they are okay, but typically they may lead to proximal junctional failure, which is uh, a more serious um, uh, issue that happens from these spine surgeries. So there are a lot of different types of uh, reasonings of why you call it failure versus kyphosis. Is a fracture uh, at the upper instrument of vertebrae or UFA plus one. There's pullout of instrumentation. Um, there's neurologic deficits due to herniation or ligamentous hypertrophy. Uh, and all of these typically require revision uh, due to uh, either hardware failure or canal compromise and neurologic deficits. A lot of them happen in the uh, thoracolumbar region as the uh, spine curves from a kyphosis to a more lordotic formation. There's two different classifications that uh, are kind of around. One is the heart ISSG, um, looking at different factors, including neurologic deficits, pain, instrumentation issues, angle of kyphosis, fractures at the UAV, UAV plus one, and the level of the uh, UAV, either it's at the thoracolumbar junction or the upper thoracic junction. And then the Yagi classification looking at um, more angulation uh, and bone rather than kind of the other issues. Both are good characterizations of it um, and help you decide uh, when you need to intervene. How to prevent it? Great question, I wish I knew. Is it inevitable? It seems like it may be in certain patient populations, unfortunately. But our hope is to try and reduce the amount or postpone the amount of inevitable um, failure. Uh, there are different ways to do this. Uh, this is kind of the next step, I think, in terms of spine reconstruction. Um, in order to preserve the PLC that we do here, preserve even the musculature, um, at the UIV, UIV plus one, um, get a soft landing with thoracic pedicle hooks or uh, transverse process hooks in order to um, keep the alignment and not disrupt any of the structures as much as we can. Um, don't overbend the rod, uh, get good reduction, um, ensure that the SVA is, uh, is accurate. Uh, and good for the patient. Uh, next slide, just the, the uh, classic Schwab paper looking at all the different angles and lines that we use to determine preoperatively how much lower doses should we give, where should we put the spine, how do we reconstruct this, these uh, complex deformities to give the patient the best outcome in order to resolve their pain, neurologic dysfunction, get their um, uh, ODI improved and hopefully reduce any sort of proximal junctional fa failure or distal junctional failure uh, so they can avoid reoperation. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but um, it's here if you wanna take a look. And the next thing we typically look at as well is uh, the Russell Lee classification that we've been kind of um, looking at a lot more at our institution at the uh, type one through four in terms of how uh, uh, your PI is and how much lower doses you can have and where to put your cages in order to get good correction so you don't over correct and make your lumbar lower doses too big for your pelvis uh, and increase the stress that you may have on the, your construct and your, your body. 
there's a posterior plumb line um, that we typically use. This is uh, one case that we did. Um, again, all these cases were done uh, at our institution with the fellows and, and residents in order to get uh, our, our best attempt to get a good correction. Uh, and all the things I'm talking about, we've done research on. Again, I just didn't put that in our uh, presentation just for time reasons, but we've presented most recently at the Spine Summit for a lot of these indications. Um, SVA, you want to make sure that your C7 plumb line is kind of above your pelvis. Uh, you can see here that this patient is leaning forward tremendously, uh, fused with a flat back deformity. And given this, we had to do a number of corrections in order to uh, realign his spine. There's the prophylactic vertebroplasty first described by Kabesh, UAV, UAV plus one cement augmentation. We've been using that a lot more frequently, especially with people with osteoporotic bone in order to create a more structurally sound UAV and UAV plus one uh, to prevent any sort of compression fracture or fractures or uh, really give the uh, top of the spine, top of the construct uh, a little more um, room And it's typically pretty easy for us to do. Um, we'll do it kind of not even in our incision, we'll do it above. We'll get, uh, you can see here, uh, just we'll put a, a jam sheet in and inject um, before we close and takes a couple minutes max. Um, one thing that we've been uh, more uh, appreciative uh, at University of South Florida and, and even here as Swedish is keeping the PLC intact, keeping those ligamentous structures and muscular structures intact in order to preserve as much as we can. You know, once you uh, denervate the muscles, once you uh, retract them for so long doing these big surgeries, they end up atrophying and they're never the same as uh, the virgin muscle that's attached and getting good blood supply and strong and be able to keep the uh, spine held up. Next thing, is it inevitable? This is a 64-year-old patient, had a T10 to pelvis, 30 years post-operative course, we just had some back pain, difficulty walking. Picture-wise, looks fantastic. Um, good uh, alignment, cages look fine, screws look good, there's a nice curve here in the thoracal, in the upper lower thoracic region, um, but unfortunately had um, neurologic deficits, and this is CT myelogram showing a uh, cord compression disc herniation at the uh, upper instrument of vertebrae and the kyphoplastic vertebrae. So unfortunately, we had to extend distally and uh, uh, proximally in order to get a good uh, realignment of the patient. Uh, we had to go up to T4, you see, I don't know if you're able to see here, but there's hooks here. Um, in order to get a soft landing, we've curved the rod to match the spine, uh, had to instrument um, down low, and I believe we did a quad rod to give it extra stability and strength um, to prevent any issues. Now, that kind of the next step is, you know, are we trying to prevent any um, prevent muscle dissection PLC issues? Is MIS a better way to do it? Uh, you keep all of those structures intact, do minimal fascial opening, um, are able to instrument and um, able to reduce pretty well with uh, the lateral technique. Um, but we've done uh, MIS uh, anterior column releases, popularized uh, in the early 2010s um, at our institution, a lot of papers about that be able to get good, really good correction, or at least lordosis at certain segments. Uh, minimal incision, minimal collateral damage, obviously that is uh, big if, if you do, so, do something there. Um, you can still keep the PLC intact, get anterior column lengthening, which a lot of these patients need, given you know, their degenerative disc disease and minimal blood loss if you do it correctly. Um, let's see. So this patient uh, has a positive CVA can get more lumbar lordosis here. Uh, you can see their degenerative disease is making them kind of flat backed. Uh, uh, we were able to get some good instrumentation uh, to the sacrum um, and the lumbar spine. Doing well, and then unfortunately a couple years after, uh, had hardware failure. You can see here the, the rods and the screws pulling out. Um, so in order to fix that, we had to go a little higher and, and increase the amount of um, instrumentation that we did. Uh, this patient here had a high um, ACR at the, I think, L23 level. Um, 
and we were able to really get uh, a good reconstruction in terms of their uh, SVA and lumbar lordosis in order to get a good, good correction. This patient here, 70 year old man, this is the one from the beginning of the case that had multiple uh, uh, MIS procedures. Again, severe coronal and sagittal imbalance, hard to tackle, where do you stop, where do you go, what do you do? Um, these are all kind of the issues of being a spine surgeon, especially in the complex world. This is a CT myelogram, just a couple snippets. Uh, severe canal stenosis, severe coronal deformity, uh, previous hardware, uh, multiple cages, screws. Um, we've been doing a lot of um, PSOs and in, in, um, you know, Schwab three, four, five, six, a lot more in order to get the good correction. Obviously, you need to do adequate decompression in order to really get um, the good re reduction as well as not having any canal compromise. This is just how we do it with, um, we use a bone scalpel, sorry, Dr. Chapman, uh, in order to uh, really cut uh, out the vertebral body and compress in order to get a good uh, reduction. So this is a post-op images and these are how it looked. Uh, uh, sorry, this is a pre-op and these are the post-op images. Uh, so again, we were using multiple working rods, satellite rods, kickstands, cross connectors, something to really keep the spine in a secure position or at least keep our hardware where we want it. There's also something that we don't really talk about in terms of uh, failure of these spinal uh, surgeries is uh, distal junctional failure. A lot of times you'll see people go from um, L2 to S1 or L4 to S1 um, and you'll have worsening pain and pull out. Uh, a lot of times you know, what they really need is pelvic fixation which can be um, troubling. Uh, one, higher morbidity, two, uh, the technique, uh, at least for neurosurgeons, not as pronounced as the orthopedic colleagues that do this all the time. Uh, putting in the SI joint, you know, the SI joint is kind of the base of the spine in a way, connecting the sacrum to the pelvis, a lot of stress on that spine initially, and when you add hardware and reduction. Um, so that's kind of that, um, kind of moving on for time purposes, but, I think uh, overall, what we are working on is uh, how to make our spine surgeries one and done. That's kind of our goal, to do the right surgery for the right patient. We've done a lot of research looking at different ways and methods to do it. I don't think there's a right way right now. I don't think we'll have one uh, in the next couple of years, but hopefully in the future, we'll be able to figure out a way to uh, improve all that. So that's kind of what we've done so far. Great, very nice, thank you. Interestingly, great minds think alike. Uh, Dr. Garrett um, uh, Lewitt, who is not here today, one of our research fellows, is working on the same thing because we think that it's far more complicated than just some angles. I have one personal statistic to offer. When, I ask, or when I'm asked, what is the rate of adjacent segment disease after fusions, I have one number. Guess what my number is? 100%. 100%. It's just a matter of how closely you look, what your definitions are, and how long you're willing to look. Yeah. And even nature has adjacent segment disease. Great case and example, couple file syndrome. Yeah. Great example, uh, lumbosacral transition anomalies. It's 100%. The question is, and this is the differentiation of the literature that I think is not emphasized enough, adjacent segment degeneration versus failure. And you made a very good point about that. Adjacent segment failure is something we have to act on and that extrapolates the surgical uh, magnifying lens dramatically. Uh, adjacent segment degeneration, it's modifiable maybe uh, with non-surgical things and being smart about it, um, uh, but that's a very different uh, ballgame from failure where we have to intervene. So we, do, we too do believe, and we have an ongoing project here. I'd love for you to put your uh, yeah, head in on great. Dr. Lewitt's paper uh, that's emerging right now. It's a great opportunity for our young students to participate. It's a larger data dive. We, the hypothesis is very simple. It's a multifactorial process, and just concentrating on angles is uh, casting that far too shallow. It's not that. And I want to point out Dr. Dekutowski again, identified uh, 